So, um, yeah, let's have a look. Do I have a next? I do. Cool. Uh, so I got a radio mic, so I can do walking around as well. Um, this is me. Um, increasingly, this is more me than Matt is me, um, because I seem to be a weird non-person who only exists on the internet, uh, as of last week. Um, but I work for startups. As you can see, I've come dressed as a startup today. Um, and I come from the Far East, the region of Shoreditch. Um, <laughs> to tell you all the good news um, about startups and what they're doing fantastically well. Prior to being a, uh, I was going to say a prophet of startups, but that will bite me in the ass for a later slide. Um, prior to doing the startup gig, um, I've worked in much larger organizations. So I worked in banking, financial services recruitment, in agency side years back, for Bloomberg, for Facebook, for big, small, all sorts of places. Um, and this is more about what we can steal from companies that are doing things well. Because steal is a good word. We shouldn't say borrow or anything nice. We're just stealing what they do. So forward partners, um, I've got to do the pitch. Uh, we invest in idea stage startups, so very early stage startups. Some of these companies you will have heard of. So I recruit for 23 of the portfolio at the moment. And they can come to us with a pitch deck, uh, a bit like Dragon's Den, and say, we want some money. And if we like them, we give them, there's a bit more due diligence than this. I, I sh I, I'm in recruitment, what do I know? But more intelligent people say, fill in some forms. And then they get 250,000 pounds. And that buys them a year in our office, and we help them build. We're a value add VC. So we do uh, talent, design, development, all of this other good stuff, and hopefully build them into companies that you'll hear of. So things like, if you've been to Old Street recently, because that's my world and the universe revolves around it, uh, you'll see it appear here. So um, they're a great example of what we do. Um, appear here have revolutionized the world of pop-up shops. Um, I get to say revolutionize and uh, disrupt a lot because I'm from startup land. Um, but appear here have disrupted and revolutionized the world of startup and pop-up shops and stuff. It used to be that Old Street Station was like a horrible crack den and it was terrible, not a good place to be. And now it's full of lovely florist shops and wonderful things and that's what they do. So they do um, short-term, super short-term leases for your Etsy business or something like that if you want a physical location and then they'll get you this shop and they've won contracts with TfL, for example. A few others you might have heard of. Uh, Stylect is Tinder for shoes. Uh, Makers Academy, not like shoes finding their pair, that would be weird, <laughs> but for people who like shoes. Um, uh, Drift Rock is a marketing tool, Parcel Bright, uh, delivery parcel. Lost My Name you may have seen on Dragon's Den. They do awesome kids' personalised books, so you type in your child's name. And they, but the thing is, there's no, the only real link uh, between all of these companies is they're broadly speaking e-commerce, which means they sell something. Uh, I get to speak to all of them, which is great, because there's a whole bunch of crazy people at all of these places, all pretending they're bigger than they are to gain trust of the gullible public uh, to buy things. So let's see how they do it. So this is more like a rant um, than, a, than a cohesive presentation. Um, and it, it's kind of the difference between the, that I've observed from working in large companies, and I'm going to try not to name the companies I've worked for because it's normally nasty because you remember the trauma from previous uh, lives. Um, so the first thing they do brilliantly is that they don't just broadcast, they engage with people. So how does a startup engage differently than a, a larger organization? And I have a great example of this. Um, in the far east of Shoreditch, um, we don't do our own laundry. Uh, we phone a company, they come and collect it, and they take it away, and then 24 hours later, they bring it back. Who's heard of that sort of stuff? Yeah. Um, there's a great company called Washbox. They're not one of ours. I'm promoting something that I don't have a share in. It's terrible. Um, so Washbox uh, have a booking system online. They were fully booked, and I tweeted, I would love to use you guys, but you're fully booked. And I got an answer back, and it was like, we're following you. Check your messages. Okay, so I went to DM in Twitter, and they came back with... Uh, we can fit you in. When's good for you? I'm like, okay, that's a different level of service that we've got to right now. Um, super engaging. The first thing I did in response was then tweet, oh my God, these guys are brilliant. Because obviously you have to, right? I mean, it's, th this was amazing. I wasn't going to have to be naked next week. I had clothes to wear or just 
buying new ones all the time, but we'll get given one from a supplier. Um, so this is like the kind of engagement that I'm interested in, this kind of concierge service. How can they really push the bar forward? Um, so what most large companies do when they try and do social, in inverted commas, is they try and steal focus from other people. And this is what my friend here is doing. Um, not pointing to you, that's, I can see a screen there, by the way, that's weird. Um, so they try and steal focus away. They're, they're basically photobombing social media. So if, if anyone has been in a large organization, or you are from larger organizations, and someone says, let's do social, it just sounds so wrong and bad. Either you are a social person or you're not a social person. So if Trevor's in the corner doing social on his own, you should avoid Trevor at that point, because that's <laughs> his private time and he should do it. So you either are or you aren't, right? So social for me, recruitment is a social business. So it's completely alien to me now that we have people who are selling something and packaging this up and selling it back to us. It's what we do. Um, so <laughs> Trying not to be too offensive. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a bit like the creepy uncle at a party, how I see most people use social media. Uh, because when you say, oh, it's great, we've got this, it allows us to post on X. And that will be Twitter or Facebook or something like that. And then I look at the feeds of these people, and all they have is an avatar of their company logo, and job, 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 job. It's, they've got no followers, or if they have, it's a scantily clad Russian lady who wants to get them a free iPad, or uh, other bot programs or something like that, going, hey, buy more followers. Um, it's useless. It's the noise of you vomiting information into the atmosphere where no one will consume it, no one cares. No one cares. Um, but it feels good, right, because you're doing social. Um, don't do that. Let's not do that. Um, so if you do do social properly, what can that look like? So this is a lovely visualization, my mouse as well, in real time. This is two hours, actually, on Twitter. Um, who remembers the Vauxhall helicopter crash when it crashed in the, it was terrible. It's nicer things in a minute, don't worry. I just, it's not just helicopter crashes. But this is uh, two hours on Twitter in response to that breaking news story. And the first thing you saw is, is one of the eyewitnesses um, who actually dominated that conversation and was given a voice. Later on, we swift, obviously, to, to news media. But you'll see that is an absolutely immense amount of people. This is two hours, and the engagement there, you've, there are 26,857 people with 33,796 tweets about this event from nothing, apropos of nothing. They've not paid for traffic. There is nothing. So the question is, to do social, do you have to crash helicopters? Luckily, the answer is no. Um, you don't. Um, so this is my social network, visualized. <laughs> this is my Twitter followers, visualized. So you can see it's mainly a big clump. And this is people who I follow who follow each other. And that's normally, for me, that's boring recruitment people talking about recruitment and HR people, there's a few magicians, and there's other people over here. But the idea is that there are some weird connections that you didn't know. And it's never the first or the secondary connections that help you spread your message in social media. It's the third or fourth. People you didn't know that you knew, or people you didn't know knew each other. So some examples that I have personally been responsible for. Um, for offending industry leaders is a good way. No, don't do that. Um, so I, I tweeted this, something to bear in mind when you use a grandiose title on LinkedIn. This guy is David Shing. He is AOL's digital prophet. Slightly outlandish title. <laughs> this guy is Tim Berners-Lee. He invented the World Wide Web protocol. He calls himself a web developer. I thought that was a nice irony, so I thought I'm going to tweet that. Let's see where that goes. 4.3 thousand <laughs> shares. And 2.2 thousand. This is quite old now. It's been reshared more times. I see it crop up in other places. People have claimed it as their own. I'm kind of OK with that. That doesn't hurt at all. Stealing my likes. Um, but it's interesting, right? It's kind of job related. A little bit job related. Not much job related, but it's worth sharing. Um, but then you can do this. You can piggyback onto that stuff. So here, 
it's a link to an ATS. It's actually me tweeting a job. But because it came off the back of this engaged audience, I can get 65 retweets for a job post, which is a bit silly. 65 retweets equates to about 20 or 30,000 individual impressions of that tweet. Click, links for this click were about 430 clicks. Probably saw about 200 candidates from it. It's silly. Absolutely silly. And how much did I pay for it? Nothing. The other thing that's happening at the moment is this. Um, and it would be silly of me not to say that, uh, not to mention this. And everyone was like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to mention that. And they were like, you arrogant shit. And I was like, yes, yes. Because um, I need the ego strokes as well. So the guy who pushed past me on the tube and suggested I go F myself just arrived for his interview with me. Um, so he arrived in my office. I tweeted it, went into the interview, thought nothing more of it. Three days ago, where are we? Oh, no, six, as of the 16th of Feb, 21,000 retweets. 584. It's just insane. So this has gone completely silly. But it has the, I guess it's suddenly it's like the, the eye of Sauron. I'm a geek, so I make these analogies. And it's just on you. So what actually happens at that point? Well, you can do other things. You can pin tweets, which are more job related. And you can use that audience and give them a shoe on some jobs in there somehow. Um, but what does this actually mean? So that tweet, as of when was this? I think this was the 16th as well, has been seen 10.4 million times. That's far too many people with too much time on their hands <laughs> reading a tweet. And I've tried to answer people about it, because everyone's like, oh, what happened, eh? Oh, what happened? I was like, well, we had the interview, because I'm a recruiter and I'm desperate. That's what happened. <laughs> but, oh, I told him. And then I interviewed him very nicely. <laughs> um, so, so this, though, is, is a great example. So you're, you're going to tweet something, and you're not going to get 10.4 million views. And I didn't expect any of this. And what can you learn from this? And is it repeatable? No, no, it's not, because it's just something stupid that happened. But the thing is, making this an audience enables this kind of stuff to happen. So if you're not even there, you're not going to benefit from it at all. There's nothing to be gained from not being there. There's everything to be gained from being there. And don't fear. So this is the other thing that startups do very, very well. No fear. Just post it. Just post it. And if that doesn't resonate with someone, if, and someone came back and they were like, oh, you're terrible, this is discrimination. And I was like, actually, being a dick on a train isn't one of the discriminatory <laughs> criteria at the moment. Age, race, sex, no, 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 no tube rage. Um, and you're okay to do that. Um, it might not resonate. It might turn some people off your business. And that's okay. Because being all things to all people isn't what you want as an employer. You want to make the thing that you do resonate with someone who wants to do it, and then they come to you. It makes the sell much easier on the back end. Uh, the other thing that startups do really well is just generally they hire people. It doesn't seem like I, I hear the war for talent and all this kind of stuff, and startups don't really get involved as much. Startup community, people want to work in startups. And they want to work because obviously there's, there's good reason why they want to work in startups. Higher order motivations are around, if you read uh, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, he talks about high order motivations around autonomy and control and being responsible for your own work. Those things are good, and you get those in spades in startups because it's always your job. It's like, hey, I've noticed we, yeah, do it because you noticed it, so it's your job now. And we have very kind of big, broad job descriptions. But finding people is easy, and I think one of the, the, the differences, and this is where I get a little bit contentious as well, there's a, a cult of sourcing at the moment in recruiting, and this is like a tangent that I'm just using a soapbox for. Uh, so the cult of sourcing at the moment tells us that you need to have the latest tools, you need to use Boolean, you need to do all of this and go and be a ninja or a god of Boolean or a barbarian of whatever. Um, and it's not true. It's not true. But it is a great example of this, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is a cognitive bias. When you learn a new skill, you think that skill is applicable everywhere. And sourcing has become a bit of this. I'm going to upset sources in the room. Who is a sourcer? Good. Ah, oh, sorry, one. Shh, it's OK. There's more of us. Um, so if you think everything can be solved with Boolean, it's a great example of this. You're probably up here in the scale. You know, you think, OK, that's good. But with experience, you start to see there are more things you can do. There are better things you can do. And there are easier ways. Let's explore an easy way. 
I want to find uh, another recruiter to come and work with me. So I go to a meetup. Gosh, that picture's not there. It's a lovely picture. Um, so I go to a meetup and I find the picture this guy's using, and he's anonymous on meetup. So I can use Google Inside Search to look for that picture. Now, I don't know his name at this point, but it, Google will let you search for images. Did you know that? So you don't write anything, you just drag the image across. Some nods. You can do that, it's great. If you were like on Tinder or something like that, is that, is that really Brad Pitt? Let's have a look. Um, and it comes up with people that look like, which is just funny to do it to yourself. But here, um, we can see that uh, this guy has the same picture on Medium, which is the blogging platform, and some other places as well. One of them was uh, Twitter. So from Medium, I get to his Twitter account. This is I'm three clicks now. I've not written any Boolean yet. I'm not going to. That's the secret. Um, so Twitter. I could contact him on Twitter, but it's quite um, a non-sticky way of contacting people. You, you have to follow them. They have to follow you to DM. You don't want to do something. Hey, want a new job? You never know who's watching their Twitter account. It's like a, an in-mail response rate. It's pretty low. Um, but from Twitter, I can get to his LinkedIn. And I could send a LinkedIn in-mail at this point, but I'd be giving LinkedIn money, and that's against my religion. So instead, I use Connectifier, um, which is a Chrome plugin that sits on top of LinkedIn and gives me his email address. Uh, he also gives me his phone number, his Twitter, About Me, Google+, Quora, LinkedIn. So this just is a, a little veil that comes across and tells me who this guy is and where he works and everything about him. That's five clicks. Oh, I dragged and dropped a picture, sorry. But that's one drag and drop and five clicks. It's about 30 seconds work to get to someone's email address. And it's the gold standard for contacting people. Never be happy with just sending an in-mail. In fact, don't send in-mails. Terrible things. Who opens in-mails if you get them yourself? You look at them because you're a recruiter, right? But if I get an in-mail, it goes to my laptop. If I get an email, my phone will buzz in my pocket and I'll see who it is. So email all the time. But we can go further than that because people are leaky sources of information. So if you go to 192.com, we can find out that this guy, Tris, who is a friend of mine, has allowed me to do this. Well, I did it once and he didn't mind, which is tacit <laughs> approval. Um, I can tell you that he once lived on the Isle of Wight when he was working as a chef, because his occupation was listed, and he has no county court judgments against him, <laughs> which is good, because it's nice to know my friends are financially viable. Um, I can pinpoint his current house from the electoral register, which is a bit creepy. Who's creeped out at the moment? It gets worse. <laughs> It's going to get worse. Um, this is a picture of Trish's kitchen um, because the address of this location was in the name of a tumbler that he had. So that's a picture of his kitchen. Now, he's particularly leaky for information, which is bad, but I'll get everyone with this one. His mother's maiden name is Smith um, because I can get a copy of his birth certificate from Ancestry.com if I wanted to. That's another five clicks. It took me about two minutes. It's quite sick, isn't it? So finding people is super easy. We don't actually need to be... I should probably stand just there. So <laughs> but, hey, if you want to steal his credit card, if you want to pickpocket him, his mother's maiden name Smith when they call up, and he's good for it, <laughs> which is cool. <laughs> Got some money. <laughs> and not bad furniture, either. So... Um, but the point of all this is that it's actually pretty easy, and I know it's a random tangent, and... Uh, the other point is that the other thing that startups have to do is save a lot of money. So if we can teach, and what I try to do is to teach people to do this rather than invest in tools that do this for them, all of those tools, like the Connectifier stuff, I think 192, if I wanted to get a criminal background check, I, it's like 20 quid. But it's very, very small amounts of money, like micropayments compared to massive sourcing tools, which would be like 10 grand. Uh, the, the next thing um, that we all hold dear um, and that startups just don't believe. Who thinks Google are great recruiters? None of us. But they, they, we hear about it all the time in the media. They're amazing. And this is it. You've obviously kind of come to terms with this now. That not, not, even recruit, not even Google recruit like the Google of the media. There's this great line uh, from Laszlo Bock who's head of people ops at Google, who says, we looked at tens of thousands of interviews and everyone who'd done the interviews and what they scored the candidate and how that person ultimately performed in their job. And there is zero relationship. It's a complete random mess. 
He said that in the New York Times. But that's less reported than, oh, Google, they're good. Yeah, yeah, Google. Oh, Google. And if you talk to a hiring manager, they'll go, oh, yeah, we want to hire the people from Google. Google, they're good. Google, yeah. I don't hate Google. They pay half my mortgage. My girlfriend works there. Um, love them dearly. Uh, keep paying her. Um, but what I do have is the issue with this mediated reality of the good that we see in the hiring community. And it's not true. And we can, we can actually say, well, eh, let's unpick some of that a little bit, because this is just people exaggerating what they do. In startup, we don't do that. We accept this. Uh, Mary Poppendike is a, an author who writes about agile software development and agile methodologies. And she says, best practices are other people's solutions to problems that you might not even have. I love that. This is a great get out of jail free card for someone who is having something imposed on them. And you go, oh, well, let's unpick that for a moment. That's my, my buzzwordy phrases. Let's, let's think about that for a moment. Do we even have these problems to solve? And this is a great example of um, when we're using an overblown process to do something. And there must be times when you sit in those meetings and go, why don't we just cut the bullshit and just do the, do the thing? Let's not have a, a process that works for 10,000 if we're only going to do this twice. Let's just do the thing. That's what she says. OK. The other thing that startups do really, really well, which is hard <coughs> for bigger organizations, is this. Any ancient Greeks? <laughs> Good. I'm going to try this. This is Chagnothis <laughs> Eafton. Yes. Um, the girlfriend's Greek as well, by the way. What it actually means is know thyself. Um, and it was said by Socrates, or maybe Chiton of Sparta, maybe Plato, maybe Pythagoras. The internet's a weird place with lots of people. Um, I couldn't find out who it was. I just mentioned them all, in case one of them sues me. Um, what do I mean by this? Well, startups are really, really introspective. And they're, they're coming, because they are very, very new, they can say things like, who do we want to be? How do we want to be seen? And what larger organizations do is just assume this stuff. Because you arrive, the company's been going for a 1,000 years, you arrive and just accept it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're number one. Brilliant. Awesome. That's cool. And this is kind of the blind acceptance and, I guess, a little bit of uh, confirmation bias on your side, because you've done so well to get the job, so the company must be brilliant, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, so it's got to be good. Um, and no one stops to just question those things and try and see it from a, th a third view, a different, different point. So. What I do with, uh, with our guys um, is have them sit down and talk about this stuff. This is uh, Laswell, Hiram Laswell. What a dude. Um, sure it's not Bob Hoskins? It does look a bit like Bob Hoskins. I was going to do a longer Friday line, but it's got lots of swearing in it. Um, so <laughs> Laswell's model is this. And this is what I make them say. Because a lot of startups make this mistake. They go the other way. And they go, well, well when I worked for McKinsey or something like that, our job descriptions were like this. About the company, a bit about you, what the job is, apply here. Great. It's not very engaging, though, is it? And it's not an advert. A job advert is, if you advertise a car, it's driving through a cornfield, and the cornfield's on fire. You don't just show them the Haynes manual and say, look, here's the technical description of the car. Right? That's, it's like, yeah, great. Yeah, economical, yeah. But it's not sexy. So I make them do this. Who is the speaker? So understand who you are and what you want out of this. So don't just talk about your company like um, you copy and paste that bit from the website, or the bit that was written 20 years ago by marketing. Tailor that to the audience. If you're recruiting a developer, that's different than recruiting an accountant. The things that get their juices running are going to be very, very different. That's quite offensive, isn't it? Juices running. Um, I wish I hadn't said that. Um, so who? The what, the message, what are you actually trying to do? So aim for the engagement. Tell them to click. There's a 78% chance more likely that people click when you say, or retweet something, when you say, please retweet in the tweet. People are sheep, who knew? Um, but the message is important. If you're advertising a job, sell the job. Don't sell the company to them. And tell them why they're important. And we'll come on to that stuff. The channel is also important. So where you're doing this advertising, where, you, where are you selling this? If you're on a job board, what's the audience for that job board? If you're in a, a startup job board like workingstartups.com or Unicorn Hunt, yes, they're all that pretentious. Um, we have Unicorn Hunt. Um, if you're there, 
you can use those buzzwords, those keywords that actually engage with that audience. That makes sense. If you're advertising for an accountant, I pick on accountants, sorry. Um, but if you're advertising for an accountant, they might not like that stuff. They might be a bit turned off by that. So tailor that message differently. Don't just post the same thing everywhere. Who knows, you might have a really cool accountant who wants to find a job on Unicorn Hunt. Um, whom? So really stop to consider the persona of the person that you're talking to. And that's very different. So in uh, software development, we talk about personas a lot more, the user. Um, so who is the consumer of your job ad, your content that you're putting out there? This applies for blog posts, for content marketing, for everything. And by the way, all job posts are content. They will read this stuff and infer things about your company, good or bad. Um, so the whom, understand that persona. If it's a developer and you have no technical background, go and speak to your developers and say, well, why do you want to work here? Why are you here? And if they say money, start to be a bit scared. Um, and then the effect, what do you actually want this piece of content, this stuff to do for you? And be aware of it right from the outset and tailor it towards that. Don't just be like, hey, my company, come, it's cool. Because uh, people do that, right? Or they do even worse. They go, Java developer, 60K. It's like the worst, it's a terrible language and it's not a great salary. So, yeah. um, The other thing I make them do to consider this persona, the whom, is do this. Who knows this? Love a bit of Maslow. Um, so money is a terrible motivator. Again, this goes back to Dan Pink. Um, it's quite good in the short term. So if I said, uh, do you want to come, we'll do this with you, uh, do you want to come and work in my company? We kick kittens downstairs. You'd go, I don't, I don't fancy that, unless you hate cats. I know you could be a cheap hire for us. But if I said, um, if I said it's a million pounds a day, you'd be like, ah. Oh. I hate kittens now, <laughs> like this. You'd be fine with it, right? So people have different motivations, but eventually the kitten death would get to you and you would give up. So the longevity wouldn't be that hard, right? So money is a terrible motivator. All you're doing by saying that you give them money is that, you, that you're going to feed and water them. That's it. You can turn up your fleshy meat bag of skills and do the skill, and then I'll pay you for the skill. It's... 1850s Industrial Revolution factory worker. That's where you are. That sucks, and that's no motivator. There's no engagement. You'll have no effect that way. Go further up the chain. Go to esteem, these emotional reasons. Why is, what are we doing, and why is that important to you? And tailor it to that per, the, the persona that you've created down here. So aim as if you're talking to one person. Don't write job content or anything like that, which is for multiple hundreds of people. Because multiple hundreds of people will apply, but they'll all be terrible. Have five people apply. Interview four, hire one. It's mostly we need one, right? Um, at the top end, you get to this kind of esteem. So this is the belonging here is like what team you'll work with, all of this kind of stuff. The esteem is why you personally will be important. Self-actualization, like the future. What, what other skills are we going to give you? All of this kind of stuff. If you write a, a job description and you take money off the table really early, people will just click and click and click and click, which is what I should do. So yeah, you have to make them want it. So uh, by understanding better what you have to offer, you can tailor that to the audience so much better. And this is what startups are amazing at, is by making you want it. Uh, they can be economical with that truth to a certain extent. So if you click on a website, you don't know that that's one guy. You don't know that when you call that number to book that holiday, it's actually the CEO of that company. First guy who delivered my washing back was the CEO of the company, which is hilarious because it was two guys at that time. But now they're much bigger. But you don't know that when you do it. So you can not fake it till you make it that much. You're always going to be truthful, but you can reflect those elements which are true and be proud of those things. So don't try and hide these things away. Uh, the last thing, uh, and probably the most cool stuff and some cool stuff which you can try, because um, I like stuff to take home. I like homework. Um, marketing for startups is not the branding stuff it used to be. It's not the old traditional stuff. Um, who's heard of growth hacking? A few people few people. Um, so a growth hacker um, will look to engage people and just move that needle like 2% each time. So if you can get more eyes on your site, it's very, very data intensive marketing. So there's a, it kind of sits, this is our lovely Venn diagram, you have to have diagrams. 
um, between marketing and engineering. So it's using a lot of data to drive people to your site, to engage with them, to make them move. Uh, and then we have uh, my corollary is uh, talent hacking, which people will hate because uh, it's a nice buzzword, is a lot better than talent acquisition because that's just acquiring it, right? Like it was a resource and that sucks to treat people like resources. So how do you get their attention in the first place? And there's a few good examples. So it's very, very metrics-led. This is my metric slide. If you do a Google image search for metrics, this is what you get, because what else was I going to use? Um, doesn't do anything exciting in a minute either. It's quite a boring slide. Um, so if you're metrics-led, the metrics we have in recruitment and hiring and HR are terrible. Um, we do things like cost per hire, time per hire. That's rubbish. Um, if you want to measure things like engagement, you should be looking to marketing and steal what they do, but steal it well. So go and talk to a marketer and talk about NPS, which is your net promoter score. So after they've gone through their interview process, one question pops up. Would you advise your friends to apply for us? One to ten. That's it. Ten of those people do it, you have an NPS score. And that's how many people are going to go and tell their friends that this is a good place. If it sucks, do something about it. And if it sucks, this is the best thing, you can go to someone and say, look, I have data that says this sucks. Because HR exists in the world of anic data, which is, well, I think, like, that's great. Enjoy your opinion. But have, do you have a spreadsheet? And this will give you a spreadsheet. And people love spreadsheets, especially engineering managers. Because if you have something that you can prove that you'll get some return on investment, you, you'll win, absolutely. So what's uh, one of the talent hacks um, that I've seen out there in the world? Um, so I use Twitter quite a lot, as you can imagine. Um, this is Make IT in Ireland, and they used a Twitter lead card. Has anyone seen these? It's a type of advertising you do on Twitter. Sweet, new stuff. Um, it has a little button to find out more. If you click that button, the person who placed this advert will get your email address, because you want to find out more. I'm interested. So if this is engaging stuff, they'll get your email address. So it wasn't these guys. It was actually one of our companies, Driftrock, who came up with uh, work at Driftrock. And it was their lovely link and their picture and all this stuff. We do different culture, all of this. And then find out more was like, uh, just find out more here. When you clicked, they got your email address. That email address went to uh, an automated out of office to talent at Driftrock or something like that. From there. Uh, you were sent uh, an out-of-office reply which said, um, this is your job. Welcome, thank you for being interested. And it was all automated. And at the bottom of that email, you got apply here. So from Twitter, in one click, they got an email, they came back, and they were in the ATS at that point, which is super fast and seamless to people. I'm interested, click, here's your job ad. That's cool stuff. Um, and the, the, the amount of time they took to do it, nothing. Nothing. These, these can be set up. And the best thing is you can target people so minutely. So if you only wanted to target divorced dog owners in the state of Utah, you could. And it will tell you exactly how many of that user population is in your target audience, and you can drill right down. Amazing. You can even target on Twitter by people who follow, which is awesome stuff. And it will only appear on those, and you'll only get the clicks. You only pay for what they click. It's worth doing these things as experiments. And this is the other thing that startups do brilliantly, experiment. So this seems like I'm really overthinking it, um, and I like that. Um, so if I am really overthinking it, candidates don't do this stuff, right? This doesn't happen on the job seeker side. Yeah, it does. Um, this is Jeremy. Forgive his moustache, he's a Frenchman. Um, Anti-French sentiment. Um, so Jeremy is an amazing, amazing marketer. He saw something that I tweeted, which was, don't tell me why you're good, show me why you're good. And it was something I tweeted angrily after reading CVs after CVs of going, I'm brilliant at this. And I'm like, I don't see any evidence of that. Tell me, show, show me. Um, so he took this idea a little bit too far. And this is, again, creepy. Um, so he already had built his own job board <laughs> in, in a Google Doc. And what this thing does, is it was scraping uh, companies that he wanted to work for. And then if it found a job, it would stick it in this Google Doc. So then he could review one Google Doc of all the companies he wanted to work for. So he's a growth hacker. He's a marketer anyway. This is his bread and butter. So I was like, OK, that's kind of interesting when he showed me. I was like, but then I do this with it. I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing, you freak? Um, 
what he actually does is finds people who works at these companies that he wants to work for. Then he finds them on faith, Facebook using graph search. This is getting creepy now, isn't it? Who uh, more creepy? So he finds them on graph search, and you could, everyone has a dot, uh, at facebook.com email address. And if you if you if you have a look, you've got an other. Does everyone know their other mailbox on Facebook? Go in there; it's full of freaks. Brilliant. Um, don't send him a message there because no one looks. Half of you didn't even know you got it, right? Um, but you can target people for advertising based on their facebook.com email address. So what he did is this. He found the people who work for those companies and he served them ads on Facebook with their own logo. And they're like, oh my god, I don't, we didn't advertise on Facebook. It's like, do you want to grow this? Yeah, just hire me. And he served them ads for himself on Facebook. <laughs> now, there is some naughtiness to this, because Facebook, the cohort size for a targeted ad on Facebook is about 19, 20 people. So if he only knows three people at the company, he has to make up 20 fake people and put them in the cohort as well. But that's fine, because you never get those clicks. So he bid really high for the click, so you know he's going to actually be viewed. But there's going to be a very, very low click-through rate, because he's only going to get three people in that cohort each time. So what he ended up with was a bunch of emails coming back to him saying, of course I want to interview you, you're a genius. This is amazing. Um, however, I use Adblock, because I'm horrible. So I didn't see his advert. <laughs> but then he wrote a massive Medium post about how he had done all this, which is where I stole all his graphics from. Um, amazing stuff. Um, and he starts with us next week at one of our companies, because he's brilliant. He didn't tell me what he could do. He showed me what I could do. So lastly. Um, <laughs> I love this. Go on, go on, go on. Yes! Um, so don't emulate. So what we do in hiring too much is we copy other people. We just, we just copy them, right? So we say, oh, what they're doing is great. Let's do what they're doing. Or their onboarding process is great. Let's copy exactly the same stuff. But it's not authentic. It's not true. So what uh, my rant, <laughs> the last part of my rant, is to insist that you collaborate with each other. So here today, you're going to make friends with these people. You're going to add them on LinkedIn. Actually follow through on that a little bit more and ask them questions. How do you do this? How do we do that? And startup's great for that sort of stuff. So lastly, um, if you want to know more about this sort of stuff, uh, the Lean Startup by Eric Reese will tell you how to do amazing things. Uh, the Growth Hacker Marketing will tell you how to do some of that data-driven stuff. And Steal Like an Artist will let you morally get away with borrowing other people's stuff and saying you're doing it artistically. Thank you. <laughs>